this history of the, um, your efforts and what you're trying to accomplish when you go to different cities? I want to make sure that police are not harassing people simply for open carrying. Um, that's one of the biggest factors of why people won't openly carry and feel they need to get a, a permit from the state to conceal carry. Um, you know, it's your right to open carry, but so many people are being shamed into not doing it because, oh, you're going to offend someone, people are going to be scared. They shouldn't be scared by a, a firearm that's simply holstered or on a sling. And a lot of people ask, well, why, why are you carrying a shotgun or a rifle? If you're under 21 years old, you can't go into Cabela's or Gander Mountain and buy a handgun. You can buy it from a private party, but you cannot buy it from an FFL. And because you can't buy it from an FFL, a lot of private parties believe it's illegal. Federal firearms. Believe it, yeah, federal firearms licensee, sorry. Um, a lot of people believe because you can't buy it from Gander Mountain or whatever, that it would be legal for them to sell it to you also. That's not true. It only applies to a federal firearms licensee selling it. So that's why I carry that. And you know, if they can't get a private party to sell it, their only option is to go to Gander Mountain, buy a rifle or a shotgun. And they should not be denied their right to carry a firearm for self-defense just because, well, it's a bigger gun. Um, the other part is the more, the more you see it, the more acceptable it becomes. You know, when I first started doing it, I got called just carrying a handgun. Uh, or I had cops called on me just because I was carrying a handgun. And the more I did it, the less people called. Started traveling to other cities. Um, I've gone to small towns of 3,000 people. Cops be called, and it all depends on the individual officer on how they respond. I've had, in a county park, out in the middle of nowhere, sheriff's deputies showed up pointing a rifle at me. And they wanted to enforce a county ordinance saying that firearms weren't allowed in park. And knowing the state laws, because I, I went through the laws, I've read them, I wanted to make sure I wasn't going to end up being uh, incarcerated for breaking the law. I want to make sure I wasn't breaking any enforceable laws. <laughs> um, I've been to Milwaukee now three or four times. And, you know, this is uh, the first time where it blew up on social media. Um, two years ago, some little 10-year-old girl got shot on a school playground by a straight bullet. She was in a coma for a few months and then she ended up dying from her wounds. I came and walked in that neighborhood. I walked around that playground. I talked with the people in that neighborhood because, you know, you have the right to, to, to keep and bear, but you also have the right to defend yourself. And the only way violent people um, will be stopped is met with force. It's unfortunate. Now, if you get to them before they turn to that path, you know, that that's better yet. But it happens. You, you can't defend yourself and say, well, here's the Quran, here's the Bible, you shouldn't be doing it. A lot of people say, I don't care. Um, I don't know how many of you have watched any of the, the videos I've had with the encounters with the police, but, you know, they, they ask for my ID. I don't have to give you my ID. I'm not doing anything illegal. You want to have a consensual conversation, ask me what kind of firearm I'm carrying? Great. But when you want to start treating me like a criminal, I'm not going to talk to you. It's about respect. You know, uh, the people that did stop and talk to, uh, to me in Milwaukee, great conversation. Um, I chatted with them as long as I could, as long as they wanted. And it's I believe it's beneficial to educate people so they know what they can do to help defend themselves, defend their communities. So this, um, when you came through Milwaukee, did it cross your mind that that would be considered a uh, danger or risk in um, compromising some yourself, but also um, people coming to you thinking that it's some kind of like, um, like skinhead or, or some kind of racist type of situation, you know what I'm saying? Um, no, um, we did have um, Elijah Wood from 
Michigan, who is um, an African American, um, walking with us. Um, like I said, I've been down here three or four other times and had no issues. Okay. Let me ask you a question. Um, a lot, a lot of us understand Second Amendment right to bear arms, and a lot of us don't. Uh, a concern of many of us is that we came into the community armed and strapped. And anytime you come into the black community like you did, it's going to cause some, some, some concern. And it did, and rightly it should, because everybody's not up on the laws with carrying weapons. I just think that maybe if you would have let us know in advance what you were doing. And like here, I'm going to be here, I'm going to be here, and when I come in, just to let you know, then we probably wouldn't be having this conversation. And I understand, you know, that's your choice to do that. But when you come into our community, you have to respect us as we respect you. You know, that's what the chaos is. That's what the concern was. When you see people just strapped up, carrying AK-47s, walking in the community, and you ain't never seen you before. And this is no disrespect. Just, I'm being real. You know, never seen you before. Don't know what you was planning on, what you was doing. When people came and talked to you, they, they, they got an understanding. But the whole community didn't understand that. And I think it's fair, and it's, it's, it should have been done. And you know, that's the way I feel about it. If, if we go in advance mm -hmm. and say, hey, next week I'm coming back down and we're going to be carrying guns and mm -hmm. this, that, and the other thing, one, we don't get an honest response from the police to find out if they're going to try and trample your rights or not. Okay. Two, someone in the neighborhood, you don't know if they're going to be carrying or not. They don't call their neighbor, hey, I'm leaving my house, I'm carrying my gun. It, you know, it's, you call your neighbor and say, hey, I'm going to the local church, synagogue, temple, mosque. Okay. It's, it is a right, and, you know, it's, I agree. Is it a moral <coughs> right to let the people in the community know that you come? Because you're not from our community. Right. And we don't know you from Adam, and it's no disrespect. I'm, I'm just being real about it. Mm -hmm. I myself would have just liked to have known that you guys were coming in and doing this, and you, you, right you have your right to bear on the Second Amendment, but you're not from our community. You know what I'm saying? You just pop up and you show up, and people were concerned about that. And when people are concerned, Word starts spreading on social media, as we know, is a big thing. I, and you were a prime <laughs> example of that. I, as soon as you <laughs> hit, and people started filming you, he got called, I got called, I'm sure the minister got called. Like, these people are in our community armed, and we don't know what to do. You know, and we're just concerned about our community. This is why we're here. It's nothing against you personally. Right. It's against the action. But, all right, I grew up in Plymouth, Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. 7,000 people. I lived there until I was 25, 27, somewhere in there. People know me. I put my shotgun on my back, I walked through town. Cops got called. Right. It, how, many, how many of your neighbors do you actually know? It could be anybody walking. They could be your next door neighbor and you don't even know them. Um, I, I've been living in Sheboygan Falls for the last 12 years. First time I decided to open carry, my neighborhood, cops got notified. Mm -hmm. People were nervous. Some guy, the, f <laughs> the first time I was open carrying, I was carrying just a sidearm on in a right. shoulder holster, went into a gas station, bought a drink. And I was just walking. And someone that saw me at that gas station left that gas station, went down to the next gas station, said there's an armed guy at that gas station, he might be coming here next. And then they called the cops. This is my neighborhood. This is where I live. Mm -hmm. So, warning, and, and if I warn someone, there's no guarantee that everybody's going to know about it. Because so let me ask you this, Will, because you see, where you live at, everybody knows each other, I'm saying, and it's not, racially, it's not as diverse as it is here. That's one thing, but here, it's like, in our community, we already have problems with violence, we already have problems with people with guns, and so the climate is different. And so you have to have an understanding of that. Even though you might hear about black on black violence, it's a real situation going on here. And so it's aggravated, aggravated more because we already are under attack our own selves with police in our community. Is that we feel like we're on a reservation as it is. So then if you mix that in with some white men coming into your community and then the police are not even pulling them over, 
because we just saying it just on the white privilege side. We talk about that on Facebook some. But the truth of it is we can't get by the concept that you have a privilege as a white man to walk all over this country however you want to. We could not go to your community doing what you did. No way. We'd be dead. We, we do have videos right? of black people walking in rich urban neighborhoods, just black people. Walk right by a cop sitting there at a bank, just sitting there waiting for speed. Yeah, that, yeah. uh, that was in Michigan. Right, but right. I'm saying in this state, even though Michigan's next door, it's, it's just a different different level of um, understanding when it comes to us going, because it's so segregated here for one. Right. We walk into an area that's strictly pretty much black on this side of town. So so that is like some, that's the, that's the basis of the foundation we're talking about as far as disrespect, what I'm saying. Because if I went to Plymouth, Seriously, and walk as you did. There's no way I'm, I'm walking out of here alive. And I don't know if you realize it, but it's true. But I just want to move by beyond that because what we have going on um, in the city, as far as ideologies, we have people that believe in carry concealed. We have people who believe in open carry. Then we're sitting inside of a location that has a historical significance and has been actually a proponent of, of no carry and still has been successful. So I want to know just from everybody that's here, is there a possibility that any of this could be meshed together or married and we could create those type of um, unified affronts to the violence and to the you know, messages that we send to the community? I, I just want to put that question to everybody. Yes, sir. Personally, when I look at the um, position of what occurred, I, I would have given a viewpoint probably as most in the room because <clears throat> I participated back in maybe 2014, 2015, on the east side after there was a string of different robberies with students getting robbed and stuff like that. So I walked with a number of different people from a local gun rights organization and uh, with open carrying and so on and so forth. And I've done that for a while, which is one of the reasons, in my opinion, I believe the government target didn't come directly to me for a few different reasons. One, I'm a black man. I'm not backing off of the city. I've fought them for a long time and beat them several times. Um, I'm Muslim. They weren't expecting that from the first concealed carry office, a whole different face. They expected some backwoods white guy to be out there doing something. Yeah, some, somebody like William to be on it, so they can try to put in some big redneck or something like that. And um, nevertheless, it was one, what I see from looking at the, the event last week. Um, there's three things we've taken. I inboxed you, so we have more discussion. One is bringing attention to an issue that our community in general, sadly, is ignorant of when it comes to open carry laws and actually gun laws, period. Um, two, education. When I looked at all the videos, I saw a lot of people having decent, good conversation. They weren't upset, scared, any of that type of stuff. They were actually um, engaging people. And of course, it was one black guy with him, but that doesn't necessarily mean much because right. I think right now, one thing, we have an underlying political situation where it can be looked at as these Trump supporters coming in town. Whereas maybe a year or two ago, it wouldn't be so sensitive, if that makes sense. And the third thing is when it comes to our leadership in our community, just being frank, um, when I was reaching out to different individuals, uh, I didn't have any specific go-to people, you know, meet from the communities and so on uh, with fighting the government. I went to the community brainstorm a breakfast, talked to a few different other individuals that weren't really interested in the terrorism and different things that were going on against me specifically, but it affects more people as a whole. So I, I couldn't say if I'm going to the east side, <coughs> if I'm going on the north side, who's the go-to guy there? Now, it was in a, an event, it was a Facebook event that was known prior to, like I got an invitation maybe a week or so beforehand to the event, but I couldn't make it with the stuff I was doing with my family. So I, said, oh, I see those three things. I see the attention, got attention, um, obviously, because we're here now speak, which is, I believe, a good thing that comes from it. Two, education, because we don't know. Three, who's the go-to people? Because he shouldn't need to come to the community to educate us and being surprised um, when young brothers and sisters don't, don't know their laws, don't know what the rights are, where we should. For example, one of the things that I remember back in the 90s, I was impressed by what the Black Panther Party for self defense in particular was knowing how Huey, Dr. Huey Newton, had knew the laws and everything else, but they were walking around open carrying long rifles, knew in that specific area, which is something we still can't actually do to this day. But we don't know it have it implemented it, let alone build bridges with people because we know white privilege exists. We know that it is a different scenario. He comes in with some other white people. However, how much more powerful would it be if 
we in our community actually link with some of these individuals where even if there's racist tendencies or other under, under um, white, white privilege that goes on, the white supremacy that goes on, many times a lot of white folks are ignorant of, they don't know. But now we can actually open a dialogue with education and they can also see our side, but that unity is really something else because now what if it's actually a whole bunch of people walking on the Second Amendment front, we leading it in our communities, of course, but now should there be a situation where the majority of white police force that patrols our community has some issues, we put their, their people in front of them. You know what I'm saying? That's at least how I looked at it as opposed to seeing it as being something chaotic. But even people who are against um, firearms, they're here, they exist. I remember being younger and, and looking at looking up some black panthers in particular because I was like, man, shoot, if I keep my nose clean, I'll actually be able to be manly enough to do that. Well, we know in the hood, we got too many people, they don't give a damn about concealed carry or open carry. They just carry as criminals and bring other stuff there. However, how positive would it be if we patrol in our own communities? Giving these youngsters, I said, you know, as long as I keep clean, I'll be able to go ahead and be a man and protect my own. You know what I'm saying? So that's my perspective of it because I saw it, looked at the different videos, I participated in stuff before. But again, who do you reach out and notify? Like you said, we notify the community. Who is it? You know, what organization is it to reach out to and be like, look, we gonna do this. We want y'all support. Let's go educate together. Who is? It? Who who will be suggested? Because I won't know now. I mean, I know I get some hey, NOI brothers connection I met. Recently, however, you know, who, who where's that organization at? Is, there, is that a vacuum that we need to fill? Or are we gonna get some solutions? But I think it's a good thing we're here today because of that. Another thing with that is, he's from here, and I'm not, none of us were, you know, he doesn't know who to reach out to. <laughs> we, we had absolutely no clue who to reach out to. And when, we, when this was planned initially, we had no idea Trump was gonna be in, I think it was West Dallas, the next day, yeah, you know, yeah, rest, these guys came from Michigan. That was planned <laughs> a while ago. They said we're going to do it. Those guys walk in Detroit, mostly white. Detroit, it is mostly black. They have very little problems with the community. The the black community is very supportive of it. The police chief in Detroit puts on the pro Second Amendment face, but his his officers, 